Hello, my name is Stuart Walthall and I'm chairman of the Locke Foundation. And we're here in the Locke Boarding House Museum in the town of Locke. And I'm going to be conducting an interview with Locke resident and photographer James Motlow about the Locke Foundation presentation of James Motlow's historic photographs, Locke in the 70s. Well, hello, James. Hi, Stuart. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Good to see you. And thank you for doing the interview here. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you get involved with <clears throat> this new exhibition that's going to be presented here at the Lock Boarding House? Stuart, to answer your question, I really need to go back to the beginning of how I arrived in Sacramento. <clears throat> Uh, as I was saying, my father was uh, part of the founding faculty at San State, so we moved up here uh, in 1950, and that began my uh, stay in Sacramento. And my mother uh, was an artist and studied out at Sac State, and through her connections, I was introduced to a whole range of artists in Sacramento at the time, Wade Tebow, Greg Condos, the Artist Contemporary Gallery. Art was always essentially a part of my upbringing. I did uh, photography school through Glenn Fishback School of Photography, who was in Sacramento. And that uh, kind of based my developing eye into what I really wanted to do, but I was very unsure about what I wanted to do with photographs. Um, from the early days of, of my involvement with photography, I realized a couple of two fundamental things for me. One was that I didn't want to live in an urban environment. Uh, the second was that I didn't want to do a studio and do wedding photography. So I moved down to San Francisco <coughs> shortly after finishing uh, Glenn Fishback's in uh, 1970. And I got to know a whole series of Bay Area photographers uh, who, were, who were all doing social, essentially, um, issues, demonstrations. I went to a number of demonstrations and photograph demonstrations I did. After being there a few months and such, I realized that that wasn't my place. I didn't know where my place was, but I knew it wasn't there. So I returned back to Sacramento where I um, began to try to figure out what I wanted to do as far as image making. And what I found myself drawn to was initially cafes, roadside cafes, and the people would hang out in late night donut holes as well as um, just kind of roadside attractions. The oddness of America really began to appeal to me. It was on a road trip in 1971. I was coming back from San Francisco, or maybe it was going to San Francisco, to tell you the truth, I really don't remember which way. But a, few, a couple of years earlier, I had met a poet that lived here in Locke. And on that road trip coming down the Sacramento River, because I hated driving down 80 to San Francisco, but knew this back way, I decided to come in and to just say hello to John Allen. So I come down Main Street, and he's gone. But his building was for rent. And it, literally at that moment, it seemed like all these things coalesced into a single moment of saying, oh my God, how could I not live on Main Street in this town? Um, and that was the first place that I lived in. And uh, that was, I said, you know, and uh, I think I said it was February 1971. Um, it was a delightful time living on Main Street. I had, uh, I had parties, I had friends who came. Uh, I was doing, at that time I was felt I was really beginning to find myself as a photographer, as an image maker. I spent the summer uh, mostly in the Central Valley photographing a Hispanic community down there. 
but I would still come back to Locke occasionally on my visits because it still felt like I needed Fire. something to be here. Mm. And if there was a fundamental change for me with my experience in Locke, it was moving back to Key Street. Oh. Having got myself all moved in, one afternoon one of my elderly neighbors came by and motioned for me to follow her, which I did. And she took me across the street into her hill building. And in the back of her home, there was a small apartment. The bathroom had been obviously settled for a while and the toilet was falling through the floor <clears throat> and various other decay was happening. And I understood from her that she wanted me, if I could, to repair it. I figured, why not? I'll try that. And so that began this kind of relationship that I had with Mrs. Leon, whose name I found, or John Ho, which I shortened it to, that I would then come over during the days and work on this project. And in the evenings, she would invite me into her home and feed me along with her husband. So, but I had, because photography, as I was saying, was very much of a part of my ongoing exploration about myself, as well as just using a camera to photograph what I was close to and photographing people. I would start photographing Mrs. Leong and her husband, but did it in a way that really wasn't the kind of portraiture that of where like we're sitting with you and I here. But it was more of like, you know, she's in a mirror, or she's cooking, or she's planting garlic, or her husband's kind of in the background, or he's on his porch smoking a pipe or something like that. Photograph what you're close to. You know, make images what you're involved with. And I was getting more and more involved with this town. And that was in the early 1973, to give kind of a date upon things, 73, 74. If there's a demarcation, if there's a, if there's a single photo where I can go back to and say, this changed everything for me here in Locke as far as photographing. And you have that photo in this show? I have this photo in this show, yes. You'll see that it's where uh, Mrs. Leong is sitting on a porch and she's holding a rose. How that came about, and she's looking directly at the camera was that I had picked some roses for a girlfriend you know, that I was going off to and saw Mrs. Leon on her porch and I went over and gave her some roses. She then simply turned around and she stood, she just pulled her shoulders back and sat up straight and basically, because I always had my camera with me at the time, was then said, okay, take my photo. Nice. And that somehow changed everything with making images here in Locke. At that point, it was that all my neighbors allowed me to take their photos. And I became, in a sense, a, a part of the town. I, I felt like I was a part of this community. What? <clears throat> time span are we talking about from what year to what year do these photographs cover? The photographs in this show basically cover from 73 to uh, I believe 76 about a three year span of time. So Locke still had a thriving Chinese community at that time. To give you an idea when I first <clears throat> moved into town after the poet who I knew had moved out I was the only non-Chinese living in town. Of course, that changed very quickly thereafter. There was a Filipino family who moved in. There were uh, John, my friend John Allen, the poet, returned and he began to live here. But yes, it was much more of a very vibrant uh, Chinese community. Uh, the Phun Hot market had already closed um, and it wasn't going. Uh, the Yun Chang market was very active. Uh, the, um, there was a number of single men that lived here. There was, um, uh, the Chan family had just arrived, um, back in, uh, the late sixties. 
Um, Connie Chan, the uh, the daughter, uh, eventually grows up and becomes the interpreter uh, and for uh, when Jeff Dylan Kirk and I did the book Bitter Melon. So yeah, it was very much of a of a Chinese community. I remember uh, sitting out on my back porch, looking out in the morning time of a whole series. There was a steady stream of my elderly nevers going either out to the garden area or to the back slough to go fishing and then coming back. Uh, on Key Street, you had a, uh, Mrs. Leong, uh, um, um, Kit, uh, so the young's wife would sit out on their porches. People, it was an active kind of, of circle of, of elderlies who would, um, be with each other. So in your show, you have a lot of portraiture, but what other kind of images were you capturing at that time of Locke? Well, initially it was mostly just portraiture, but then I realized that there was other aspects that, in a sense, that I found very interesting. The growing of the vegetables, the drying of the vegetables, uh, the... Uh, I, one of my favorite photos is Wong Buck with the Duong Qua melons in his wheelbarrow. Um, the uh, Mrs. Leong planting garlic is another favorite photo of mine. Um, the hanging of the Chung Choi on, on Key Street by uh, Mrs. Leong and, and Mrs. O Yang. Uh, those kinds of um, images and as well as you know just the architecture Main Street lock yeah do you have one favorite image oh that's a tough one Stuart I think the one that reaches I think to my heart for me in a sense the complexity of an image meaning not only does it visually work is there a harmony to to the visual elements in it but also into the mysteries of the human spirit. And I think that would be the interior of So Young's house with the wedding photographs looking back to the bedroom. Yeah. Uh, and so working with the Chinese Cultural Center, I put together this series of 45 images for them. And that was displayed there. And that's the show that we're currently That is the show that, yes. And how that actually and then the, the, the product that you see upstairs here <clears throat> was the outgrowth of that. The Chinese Cultural Center and I worked out a deal that the images <coughs> would be, um, I would give to them. They would package them into a traveling exhibition, which they did, and they, that would travel around America, which it did. One of the ironies of the show is that when that show was up at that time, uh, a man from Hong Kong who was staying in the Holiday Inn building, he and his wife Fancy um, comes down and sees the show. He realizes that <clears throat> the people who lived here uh, and the dialect that they spoke, he had family members, he had <coughs> history too. His name was Indu Tai, he was a Hong Kong developer. He had developed the Hong Kong style di uh, um, um, condominiums right after World War II. Fabulously wealthy man. He comes up here to Locke to see the town. At that time, Locke in the entire Locke estate was for sale, but because of a whole series of, of difficulties, nobody wanted to buy the entire Locke estate. <coughs> so the wealthy Hong Kong developer came up here to check out the town of Locke, which was for sale. That's interesting in itself. Well, it was not only the town that was for sale, but it was the 480, uh, yes, I think it was 480 acres, which was for sale, which was a valuable piece of, of Delta agricultural land. But because the town, with its aging sewer system, water structure, uh, plus its elderly inhabitants, 
Brazos, it was such a difficult sale that nobody wanted to buy it. The, uh, it had gone into a conservatorship and the executors of that uh, were a local couple and who didn't really want to have that position. They wanted to sell it desperately because they didn't want to be burdened by it, but nobody would buy it. And, but In Du Tai saw it as an opportunity and he thought that what this would be a perfect spot for would be a series of like a uh, Hong Kong style Disneyland. You would have condominiums, you would have rides, you would have dragon boat races, mm -hmm. you would have... He was pagodas. A, pagodas. You, this was a spot he looked at and thought, wow, why not? But the reality of the zoning, the agricultural land, as well as the rising up of the population here of saying, whoa, wait a minute, you can't do that to us here. And so all of those plans were nixed. And well, was Sacramento County reluctant to these grandiose plans to? Uh, well, yes, because first of all, this is a floodplain. They did it was zone agriculture. You couldn't have those kinds of developments here, as well as the historical significance now that Locke has to it. They saw that it would be severely damaged, and they wanted to preserve this as a historical document. Uh, Locke had already, by the night, beginning of, I think it was in 1970, it, got, it became on the National Register of Historical Places. Yeah. And that helped to anchor <coughs> the historical significance of the town. What happened next? He bought the town. He buys the town. He installs uh, his, his um, brother-in-law, Clarence Chu, into being his overseas representative here. And Clarence, who is his, has always been very intimately involved with the town, he, he always has tried to do the best for the town um, and eventually is very key at helping it move into its current uh, state of being uh, separate to itself now rather than no more part of the lock ranch in that uh, you now have a separate ownership of the land and uh, as well as the buildings. Yeah. Okay, now you have this great collection of artistic and historic images of Locke. You've had them exhibited in a number of places. They've even toured what was next for those images? That's a very good question, Stuart. The reason that strikes me is because that po I didn't know what was next. I knew that I had done those images. I was also, good. this was now right around 1978, 1979. Uh, I was feeling that myself that I kind of needed more of a greater, in a sense, I'd become too comfortable here in Locke making images. I needed to push myself as a photographer. I decided in uh, 1979 I moved out of Locke and I moved down to the Bay Area, but I still it felt like I would return every single weekend almost back here. Um, and what did you do in San Francisco? Well my initial idea was that I was to I wanted to get a master's in photography and so I was accepted into the master's program at um, the Art Institute and in order to to in a sense, pay for things. I didn't want to have to make my living as a photographer, which I had been doing primarily when I lived out here. Um, but I took a job at a, at a tour boat company that was just starting, the Blue and Gold Fleet. And that well, I was, I think I was the fourth person hired. So I had my lock images. Um, I wanted, I began to get the realization that I had 
a bigger responsibility to, to those images rather than just simply them being uh, exhibited occasionally or um, shown occasionally. I realized that I had been given a gift. There was, a, in a sense, a privilege that I had with my experience here. And talking it over with a journalist friend of mine, Jeff Gillenkirk, we came up with this idea of trying to put together a book. I had kind of already put together uh, the photographs into kind of a larger, you know, just way of showing them, a book form. But it wasn't, I was very kind of undefined. I didn't quite know what I wanted to do with that. And, but it was with Jeff's urging and, and talking that we began to develop this idea to uh, have a series of oral histories with my images that the genesis of the book Bitter Melon came about. But it was that kind of that epiphany that, um, that I owed something back to the town. I owed something to these people who had let me into their lives. Who and these would be the oral histories of the people within those images. Exactly, yes. Uh, Jeff and I put together a series of, of questions and using Connie Chan, my young neighbor, um, we then conducted these interviews and then... And Connie Chan was doing the translating. Doing the translating, right. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. So it was a whole series of, of just trying to take an idea and bring it into something that was real. Giving a printed voice to the images you already had. Correct. <clears throat> we did some new images. Some of the images that are in there, uh, a few of the images that are in the book uh, are not in the show. Um, these would be later images. These would be the later images that we did specifically for the book. But yeah. Good. Well, then Bitter Melon has been in print for how long? It was initially published by the University of Washington in 1987. It's been in continuous print then. Uh, after uh, the, um, the contract ran out with the University of Washington, heyday. Press um, in Berkeley picked it up and was publishing it um, through its next editions. Um, a, in 2014, Jeff and I decided to to publish it ourselves, and so we took over the publishing rights to it and had a new batch of uh, of a little over 4,000 printed, and it's still actively being sold here in Locke. Oh, that's, that's great. great. <clears throat> I think we should mention here too that Jeff Jellenkirk has passed away. This was two years ago. Uh, yes, it was November twenty second, two thousand sixteen. Uh, that Jeff um, was standing one moment and collapsed and was dead by the time he hit the floor. Mm -hmm. Tragedy. And Jeff is responsible for the text in this bitter melon. <clears throat> which I like to say is the definitive biography of the town of Locke. It's such a wonderful book. Well, this is great, James, and now we get to have those images, your original images, on display here at the Locke Boarding House Museum. And to have them for a good long time, too. We're going to have the run of a five-month run and the reception on April 28th, 2019. So is there anything else you want to add to the actual exhibit itself? It's, it, it's such a pleasure that you're working closely with the Locke Foundation, uh, which by the way is the only organization totally um, whose sole mission is to advocate for the town of Locke and to educate the public about the history and legacy of the town. And now we have you here with your original images and giving your lecture. <clears throat> and 
Is there anything else you'd like to add regarding this show? We've got 47 images. Well, there's 45 images with the informational panels. It makes right. 47 Occupying the entire upstairs mm -hmm. of the lock boarding house. <clears throat> well, what I'd like to close with, Stuart, is the recognition of the importance of the Lock Foundation. And it's an honor for me to be able to uh, bring this show to you. And it's at, with the, um, uh, the Chinese Cultural Center, uh, by contract, has now given this group of photographs to the Locke Foundation. Oh, this is and wonderful. And that it is uh, an ongoing show that I hope that the Foundation not only shows during these months, but at some point, hopefully, will be woven into a complete, uh, more very comprehensive story about Locke. Uh, because in my research and my learning over the course of many years about Locke, it is truly one of the most unique symbols of the Chinese experience here in America and really needs to be um, looked at and appreciated by people beyond that we want it to be here for another hundred years. We just had the hundredth year anniversary in 2015. Uh, so I would encourage all the listeners and people who come to Locke to appreciate and to look and to imagine what this town was like. And hopefully through my photographs and other photographs that you can have an idea of what that was. Well, you've created, you've captured such an important <clears throat> era in the town of Locke, this transitional era. A lot going from pure Chinese town into what it's becoming now is more of a historic town. So, thank you very much for what you're doing for the Locke Foundation, James. Thank you. Mm.